Hvorfor ikke få morgen med min familie til at gå som smur? Hver dag. God morgen. We've got 101 best kept Hollywood secrets, and we're gonna count them down. One, Hvem er de gift med? Hvem hader hinanden? Og hvilke kun for voksne film har de spillet med i? Du får de 101 bedste hemmeligheder lige her. Programmet præsenteres i samarbejde med Centurion Cykler. Can you keep a secret? Neither can we. We've got 101 best kept Hollywood secrets, and we're gonna count them down one juicy gem at a time. We'll unmask the fun secrets, the fatal secrets, the secrets that were kept hush hush for years, and the behind the scenes activities you were never supposed to uncover. Some secrets you may have already heard, but you need to know more about, and others you were never meant to hear, but we can't keep to ourselves. From clandestine romances, to secret marriages, to behind the scenes betrayals that had us all fooled, until now. Rosie's big secret, the other one. A Whitney bombshell that doesn't involve Bobby, Laura Flynn's secret past, and we're not talking Jack. What's up with Sharon Stones? And so many more. These are 101 best kept Hollywood secrets. Let's kick off the countdown with the two most famous Australian movie stars. Now, if you assume that's Mel Gibson and Nicole Kidman, you're wrong. That's right, wrong. Mel and Nicole are not native Australians. Both were born in America. Surprise! You know, I was about 25, 26 when I came back here, and I felt at home because, um, you know, I'd spent the first 12 years of my life here. Mel Gibson hails from Peekskill, New York. The future filmmaker was almost 12 years old before his family relocated down under. You change your whole environment, you could rip your hair out. I mean, the insecurity is palpable. I'm a hybrid, I guess. Nicole Kidman was born in Hawaii, where her father attended the University of Hawaii on a scholarship. Nick's parents took her to Washington, D.C. before heading back to their native Australia when she was three. Australians have a good sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> How do they keep their accents for that long? It's so bizarre. By the way, if you guessed Russell Crowe, you're still wrong. I was born in New Zealand, but uh, I got to Australia when I was four. That's right. Crowe is really a Kiwi, but all three actors now consider Australia home. They really got that whole Aussie thing going, you know? But, um, I still like them. <laughs> Pop music history includes a number of great artists who have succeeded despite being blind, from Ray Charles to Stevie Wonder. But Hollywood's best kept secret number 100. For a short time in 1998, Janet Jackson was part of that group. According to Janet herself, this startling secret began while she was on tour in Lyon, France. A playful puppy accidentally scratched one of Janet's corneas leaving her temporarily sightless in one eye. When you get a scratch, the protective surface has been eroded and no longer protects against infection. And the infection could have entered Janet's eyes and progressed to the back of the eye and even led to the loss of her eye. In a bizarre coincidence, within days of that accident, Janet suffered a paper cut on her other cornea. She had a severe injury that could have happened to anybody, but it's a very freak accident that happened to both eyes at the same time. Janet's eyes swelled up to the size of golf balls. She was unable to expose her eyes to light without experiencing excruciating pain. The singer was hospitalized and for several weeks virtually blind. Only close friends and family members knew of Janet's anguish. Both eyes were actually patched and she was blinded. She could not see light really through those patches and it was quite a traumatic episode for her. Eventually Janet recovered and the tour continued. But for approximately one month in 1998, the Princess of Pop's blindness was Hollywood's best kept secret, number 100. Thanks to Joan Rivers, the most common question on the red carpet is, Who are you wearing? 
And who are you wearing? Whose dress is this? But the question Joan might want to ask is, what did it take to get you to wear it? Anything underneath? Yeah. You look so gorgeous. <laughs> it's no secret that designers seduce celebrities with their creations. When Halle Berry wore an Ellie Saab dress to the Academy Awards, the publicity was worth millions to the up-and-coming designer. There have long been rumors that some designers pay the stars who wear their creations. That is one of the world's best-kept secrets. So, you know, a lot of designers, they want to get attention. They want to make the money from having a very famous person wearing their gowns. They don't give them cash. They give them clothes. They woo them in different ways. Still, it's no surprise that the race to get a designer's best dress on the best actress has gotten a little out of hand. Stylists hoard dresses. Like, there'll be an amazing, um, I don't know, a Ralph Lauren dress that would really, really suit one actress. And the stylist will hoard it, um, saying that, oh no, this actress may well wear it right up until, like, the Friday before. Fashion designers entice the glamorous ones with gifts, jewelry, even tickets to $10,000 a plate charity fundraisers. There are trips to Milan for fittings, matching designer handbags, free shoes and accessories worth thousands of dollars. And while most designers officially loan their couture to the stars, more than a few ladies keep their gorgeous gowns. After all, what's a $20,000 dress between friends? Oftentimes, if a designer has made a dress for you, then you keep it because it's going to be specifically for you and it's not going to fit anyone else and you can only wear it that one time anyway. For the 1997 Oscar ceremony, Lauren Hawley had her choice of 56 gowns from 13 different designers and Lauren wasn't even nominated. Next time Joan tells a celebrity she looks like a million bucks, she might be right on the money. Reality shows like Survivor and The Apprentice are addictive. Night after night, viewers tune in to find out who will be cast aside and who will be the big winner. We have a million dollar prize. For the average person in the United States, that's a hell of a lot of money. But some reality shows are taped months before they air, so the champs have already been chosen. When taping The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, the final rose is bestowed a full two months before the finale airs. Exciting. It's just like it doesn't happen to you every day. <laughs> the fact that I have to keep this secret for two months is going to kill me. Richard Hatch was the first winner of Survivor, but the final episode was taped four months before it was actually broadcast. I went camping for 39 days and now people are um, involved in a bunch of hoopla. There are hundreds of people involved in making a reality show. Producers, crew, and the contestants themselves. So, how do the secrets remain secret? One word, contract, five million dollars if you violate it. You go through gnarly background checks and then you sign a confidentiality agreement which is about this big. If you think what they do to them on the show is bad, you should see what happens if they break the contract. There's five million dollars hanging over your head if, if, you know, someone finds out. Crew members who talk risk losing their job. Contestants who spill the beans forfeit their winnings. For a show like The Bachelor, the couple in love can't even be seen together until the final episode airs. I think it must be so difficult you want to tell your best friend and the best friend wants to tell the other best friend. Yep, there are certain concessions one has to make for 15 minutes of fame. Best kept secret number 98. Coming up on 101 Best Kept Hollywood Secrets, what you didn't know about Ashton Kutcher. Reese's roots, and they aren't blonde. And from here to paternity, plus a man lying about his age. I just love that. We'll be back in a flash. We're back, counting down 101 best kept secrets. From the time she was a toddler, Liv Tyler knew her daddy was a rock star. But for the first 10 years of her life, Liv thought her father was musician Todd Rundgren. He was her daddy. Liv's mother, model B.B. Buell, wanted to raise her daughter in a normal environment. Her biological father, Stephen, had an enormous drug problem, and I think that everybody knows that. I don't think that that's a secret. I was in another land back then, you know. I was so high all the time, and it took precedence. So B.B.'s former flame, Todd Rundgren, agreed to sign Liv's birth certificate as father. But when Liv was eight, 
she saw Steven Tyler at a Rundgren concert. She just felt connected to him and bonded to him pretty much immediately. I didn't really know what it was, but um, now I know. When Liv was 10, she noticed a girl at an Aerosmith concert who looked just like her. She finally met her half-sister Mia in August of 1988, the famous concert. I mean, there was no denying it. She and Mia looked like bookends. My dad's got these incredibly strong genes. We all, my sisters and brothers, we look like twins. Mia was Stephen's daughter by his first wife. Right then and there, Liv confronted her mother, and the truth came out. She turned to me and said, Mom, is that my father? I think that there was no way I could deny it at that point. I just fell in love with him from the first second I spoke to him. I looked into her eyes. That's all I needed to see, you know. And I cried, tried to not let her see it. And I've just been engulfed in her love ever since. She's been such a gift, you know. Liv still refers to Todd Rundgren as her spiritual father. But she has a relationship with her biological dad, too. He's definitely my dad, and he's the guy who taught me how to floss and just all the normal things you do with dads. Liv Tyler and her two fathers, Hollywood's Best Kept Secret, number 97. My Two Dads is not just a sitcom. It is Liv's real life. Here's the story of a man named Brady who was busy with a secret of his own. In 1969, actor Robert Reed landed the role of Mike Brady on The Brady Bunch. Reed soon became an icon of American fatherhood. But Mr. Brady had a secret. He was gay. If he'd revealed that he was gay when the show was going on, I'm sure the show would have been canned like that. Especially because it was a family values type show. Bob Reed never flaunted his sexuality. He was what he was. I'm assuming that at the time, the majority of actors that were gay kept their lives a secret, America wouldn't have liked it. By day, Reed was TV's favorite sitcom dad. By night, he frequented gay bars in Los Angeles, seeking companionship. This was the era before Will and Grace, before Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, before it was somewhat acceptable to come out. It was a time when a gay actor had to remain in the closet in order to stay employed. That's where Robert Reed stayed, in the closet, until his death in 1992. There was always rumors, but you know, I didn't even know what that really meant, nor did it really matter to me. Here he was, America's favorite father. I just don't think he wanted that to come out. I don't think he wanted to deal with it. And uh, sometimes I think we choose, you know, how quickly we're gonna leave this world. And I think he made a choice to go. After it was revealed that AIDS took his life, Robert Reed's homosexuality became public knowledge. But for a while, the private life of Papa Brady was best kept Hollywood secret number 96. He has a very special place in my heart. Since the dawn of cinema, actors have changed their names to make them more memorable. Some wanted to simplify. Isser Danielovich became Kirk Douglas. Some wanted to add zinc. Karen Johnson became Whoopi Goldberg. You're kidding, her real name isn't Whoopi? and a few were forced to improvise because somebody else was already using their name. A young actor named Michael Douglas had to change his name to Michael Keaton because the Screen Actors Guild already had a Michael Douglas, the Michael Douglas. Yeah, you could say that. Michael J. Fox's real name is Michael A. Fox. A is for Andrew. But Fox didn't like the sound of that, and there was already another actor named Michael Fox. So Michael came up with J, which doesn't stand for anything at all. A few other transformations? Rapper Nelly was born Cornell Hayes. Elle McPherson, Eleanor Gao. Faith Hill, Audrey Perry. Rodney Dangerfield, Jacob Cohen. Demi Moore, Demetria Gines. And Ashton Kutcher's real first name isn't Ashton. Kutcher was born either Lawrence, Christopher, or John. Take a guess. We'll give you the answer right after the break. Also coming up. I waiter at this one restaurant. I, all of a sudden, I see him on television as a gigolo. <laughs> We're back, counting down 101 best kept secrets. Before the break, we asked you to guess the real first name of Ashton Kutcher. Did you think it was Lawrence, Christopher, or John? This talented guy from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, was born Christopher Ashton Kutcher. 
She's legally blonde and totally adorable. Everyone knows that. But Reese Witherspoon has a surprising pedigree, and it's our secret number 94. It seemed ludicrous for Elle Woods, the character Reese played in Legally Blonde, to apply for admission to Harvard Law School, but it would have been perfectly natural for Reese. Girls, I'm going to Harvard. You mean like on vacay? Let's all go! Road trip! You see, the actress's father is a surgeon and mother is a PhD. And one of Reese's ancestors, John Witherspoon, was president of Princeton University. Pretty impressive, wouldn't you say? Even more impressive is that the signature of John Witherspoon appears on the original Declaration of Independence. Yep, Reese comes from a long line of truly American patriots. Oh, and she's totally adorable, too. <laughs> Hi, we're the Backstreet Boys. In 1997, the Backstreet Boys were what you'd call hot. Their wholesome but sexy act sold millions of records and attracted countless fans. These guys were on top of the world. During a late night video shoot in 2000, Backstreet Boy A.J. McClain tried cocaine for the first time. In the tumultuous year that followed, A.J.'s drug and alcohol abuse became Hollywood's best kept secret, number 93. There were times when he would uh, drink up to an entire fifth of Jack Daniels in, in an evening, just doing shots. And then he talks about doing an eight ball of Coke, which I guess is an entire package of, of cocaine. He missed rehearsals and personal appearances. The band's management suspected AJ was on something, and the boys began undergoing random drug testing. But the addict in AJ was deceptive. He outsmarted the drug testers and just kept on using. I think that if you're that addicted, you'll go to any lengths to hide it. In July 2001, fellow Backstreet Boy Kevin Richardson broke down AJ's door and confronted him. AJ checked himself into an Arizona rehab clinic. The band had discussed it. They wanted to come clean with their fans. They felt they owed it to them to come clean with them and let them know that, yes, he had a problem, but he was seeking help because he had chosen with them to go into rehab, you know, voluntarily. You can't resolve a problem unless you admit that you have one. So I thank God that he did that. They're the ones who need to know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. In so many Hollywood rehab situations, everybody, not just in Hollywood, but in the nation, is cheering for them to get better. In 2003, AJ thanked his bandmates for saving his life. AJ's problems are documented in the book his mother Denise wrote called Backstreet Mom. AJ is now clean and sober, but his problems were once Hollywood's best kept secret, number 93. Knock on wood. You just gotta take it one day at a time. You gotta work the steps. What secrets? In 1993, Conan O'Brien succeeded David Letterman in the 12.30 a.m. time slot on NBC. The reaction was, Conan who? Because I was someone who came out of nowhere to do the program, we always felt like the show should reflect that and take insane, risky chances. At the time, O'Brien was a comedy writer, known in the industry but unknown to the public. For the first year of its existence, Late Night with Conan O'Brien was a touch-and-go experiment in oddball humor. Do the monologue from over in that area. That's the audience right there. That holds 500 people, and uh, we will have that one-third filled. The show earned minuscule ratings. I'd say the biggest pressure is just for it to be good. According to a Playboy magazine interview with Conan, at the end of his first year, NBC executives offered the star a week-to-week -week contract. Not only was this an insult, it was practically unheard of in television. Late Night with Conan O'Brien was actually canceled for one night. There's no show tonight. It starts tomorrow. Even Conan didn't know this until years later. As long as my show's still on, I could care about the rest of NBC. The network brass pulled the plug on Conan early in 93. NBC exec Don Olmeyer saved the show by convincing his bosses not to take Conan off the air until a new show was ready to fill the time slot. That new show never materialized, and Conan was able to survive and thrive. You're fired. Wait, you're rehired by default. <laughs> That's gotta be nice. This was TV's equivalent of slipping through the hangman's noose. There will be no fresh faces in comedy. We're putting a stop to that. 
because that hurts people like me. From a clandestine cancellation to living large and late night, Conan O'Brien, best kept secret number 92. We've seen the models. We've seen the lingerie. Okay, so it's not one of Hollywood's best kept secrets, but it's something we wanted to know. Let's call it a half secret. We thought we'd pose the question, what exactly is Victoria's Secret? Wouldn't we all like to know what Victoria's Secret really is? Victoria's Secret is that the underwear was made by men to make women look great, but it doesn't fit real people. I personally shop at Victor's Secret to truck stop up uh, the 101. It's called laugh often, play aggressively, and whatever you do, whatever you do, always remember Omarosa. <laughs> our Hollywood half-secret. Coming up on The Countdown, weddings that shocked the world and a disclosure that shocked a courtroom. Plus, who didn't want to be a porn star when they were 16? Back in a flash. We're back, counting down the most riveting secrets Hollywood failed to keep. Nora Louise Kuzma was 15 years old when she moved to California with her stepfather in 1983. Young Nora obtained a fake ID that identified her as 22-year-old Christy Nussman. The girl possessed a combination of innocence and sex appeal, and the nubile Nora began posing in magazines, nude. My dreams were bigger than my fears. Three months after her 16th birthday, she was named Penthouse's Pet of the Month. By then, she adopted yet another identity, Tracy Lords. From 1984 through 86, Tracy made more than 100 hardcore adult films, all but one of them when she was under the age of 18. And in the US, that's illegal. Apparently, she had the one great piece of ID, a United States passport. Are we not to believe our own government? Who would have thought in a million years that it was all fake? How did she know what to do? It's incredulous. What do they teach these kids in junior high today? Shortly after her 18th birthday, Tracy flew to France to shoot the X-rated feature, Tracy, I Love You. By the time she returned home, the FBI raided Tracy's house along with several adult film companies. It seems somebody tipped off the feds. Every movie Tracy made before turning 18 was confiscated and destroyed. Imagine she was a wonderful actress, so they couldn't possibly believe she was under the age of 21. Because acting is all important in those pornos. She was getting a lot of work, if you will. So I think in her case, it was best for her to keep her mouth shut. But I think it only did damage for her in the end. Although Tracy was finally legal, she quit the porn business and pursued a career in legit films and TV. But for a while, the truth about this underage adult film star was a well-kept secret, number 91. It was a long time ago. You would think that people would get sick of talking about it. God knows I am. In 1996, two Texas roommates made their big screen debuts with the independent movie Bottle Rocket. And my name's Dignan, man, so what? <laughs> Actor Owen Wilson and director Wes Anderson have since gone on to make more commercial films, including Rushmore and the Royal Tenenbaums. And they've got a royal secret that comes in at number 90 on our list. Before the buddies hit it big, they were just two college kids trying to make ends meet. And we just have a very similar um, perspective about a lot of things and find a lot of the same things funny. We're quite in sync with that kind of stuff. Owen and Wes shared an apartment in Austin that was so run down the windows wouldn't even shut properly. The boys refused to pay the rent until the windows were fixed, but the landlord refused to fix the windows until the rent was paid. What could a couple of poor but creative college students do? They staged a robbery. Then they called the cops. When the landlord inspected the scene of the crime, he immediately suspected his tenants, and the police refused to get involved. So. Wes and Owen skipped town. The landlord hired a private detective to find them. Stage a burglary? I don't think so. It makes you look even worse than your bad landlord. You can either go to court, which takes forever, or you uh, stage a robbery. Justified. In the end, both parties worked out their differences. A few months later, the guys wrote Bottle Rocket, and they were on their way. Action! Now these two A-listers can afford to buy instead of rent. What's all 
I remember this guy had a piece of tape on his nose. Hollywood's best kept secret, number 90. Hey, who are you? Ashley. Hi, I'm Mary Kate, and I'm Ashley. Mary Kate and Ashley Olson may be twin sisters, but they want to be treated as individuals. Damn it! These two babes grew up in front of our eyes, even if we weren't always sure how many of them there were. Which brings us to secret number 89. They were great babies, and their temperament was really good, and, and people liked them, and they seemed to have fun, as much fun as they could. In 1987, the girls were cast in the sitcom Full House. They were just nine months old. According to the credits of the show, the role of Michelle Tanner was played by Mary Kate Ashley Olsen. Some viewers naturally assumed Mary Kate Ashley Olsen was one child with a very long name. After the first season, producers decided to clear things up by giving the girls separate credits. For years, Mary Kate and Ashley were known as the Olsen twins. Then, for a while, they were simply Mary Kate and Ashley. Now they're trying to separate their identities, but they're still the same person. I can't ever tell the difference between one or the other. Now that they're young ladies, not to mention tycoons, one of them is Mary Kate Olsen and the other is Ashley Olsen. And don't you forget it. You know, they're just evolving like any young girl does into a woman. They're just finding their sexuality and who they are, and they're owning it. I actually think the girls should have kept the ruse up, because if people only thought there were one of them, just think they could still be making all that money, but one could be sleeping in every day. Mary, Kate, and Ashley got the last word, didn't they? Didn't they? Coming up on 101 Best Kept Hollywood Secrets, how do people so public keep something so private? A conviction of manslaughter and a secret that rattled a sponsor. Plus, it's the only secret I've seen kept in Washington in three years. We'll be right back. We've got a Hollywood secret, actually 101 of them, and we're counting them down. In 1996, Melissa Etheridge and her partner, Julie Seifer, were featured on the cover of Newsweek for making the daring decision to have a child together. For the next three and a half years, the identity of that child's father was Hollywood's best kept secret number 88. We thought that the world just didn't need to know, that it was just, you know, it's our business. It's, and this was a very personal thing, very, very personal thing. If I was having a baby with someone famous, I'm not gonna tell anyone. I mean, I'd keep it private as long as I can. The rumors flew. Was it Brad Pitt, Tom Hanks, Bruce Springsteen? In January 2000, Melissa and Julie set the record straight, so to speak. It turned out that rock legend David Crosby was the biological father of the couple's two children. Crosby's wife, Jan, actually suggested the lesbian couple use Crosby as a sperm donor. They had an obvious love for each other, a deep, deep love for each other. It just seemed like the thing to do. You know, after she said it, I didn't really hesitate or anything. I, I, I thought it sounded like a, a good, you know, kind, generous kind of thing to do. I still, to this day, am overwhelmed by her complete generosity and openness and understanding. We're just like any other couple with two kids. We have the same core issues and the same core beliefs. Although their romantic relationship ended, Julie and Melissa continue to raise their children together, and the baby's daddy is no longer a secret. I started thinking about my children. I started thinking about them in school, and I didn't want to leave them open to someone who might approach them and go, hey, who's your daddy, who's your father? Melissa and Julie told her that yes, she did have a daddy, and, uh, and it was uh, that funny man with a mustache. We really didn't think it would have the reaction that it did. It was crazy there for a couple of weeks. Let's face it, paparazzi and nosy reporters make it difficult for certain celebrities to maintain privacy. That's why some stars go to great lengths to keep their most personal events a secret. Take weddings, for example. Between the guest list, the flower arrangements, and the fussy caterer, the last thing a bride wants to worry about is to shield the ceremony from helicopters. Hollywood's best kept secret number 87, High-powered couples who managed to avoid the media wedding circus. 
In 1998, Sharon Stone told friends she was having a Valentine's Day party at her place. Surprise! Guests were treated to more than just heart-shaped cookies. A ceremony took place. Stone married newspaper editor Phil Bronstein. He wrote me letters. It was very kind of old-fashioned courting because I wasn't very open to it. Unfortunately, they split in 2003. In 2002, friends and family were invited to Julia Roberts' New Mexico ranch to celebrate Independence Day. Instead, they celebrated the union of Julia and cameraman Danny Motor. Julia and Danny lured their guests to her Taos ranch with an invitation that said, come celebrate Independence Day. Um, Julia and Danny summoned a court clerk to the property um, who gave them a marriage license. They provided a $25 check and signed autographs. A pregnant Gwyneth Paltrow avoided the paparazzi by sneaking up to Santa Barbara with musician Chris Martin. I really adore British men. I think they're adorable. Their secret wedding took place in December 2003. Six months later, Gwyneth gave birth to a baby girl named Apple. On the flip side, the nuptials of Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck were so heavily publicized that there was talk of hiring air traffic controllers to keep the news helicopters from crashing into one another. Of course, nobody needed the copters, as that wedding never happened. But then, J-Lo surprised everyone. In June 2004, just five months after splitting with Affleck, she married singer Mark Anthony in the backyard of her L.A. mansion. A small group of friends and family attended the ceremony. Easily the best secret wedding yet. It just goes to show you, in Hollywood, sometimes the best kept secrets are best kept secret. I got them both. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Every year, the award season kicks off with the star-studded Golden Globes. And when a star wins one of the prestigious statues, he or she becomes the instant favorite in the Oscar race. But what you're about to hear may shock you. More than 4,500 Academy members vote on the Oscars each year, so it normally takes hundreds, if not thousands, of votes to win. The foreign press is a different story. An actor can take home the gold with only 19 votes. I feel like a bunch of friends uh, gave me this award. Huge surprise. Let's do the math. The Hollywood Foreign Press Association consists of 90 members. Most categories have five nominees, if the vote is evenly split, each actor would get 18 votes. And when the voting's that close, it can take less than 20 votes to win a Golden Globe and the inside track for an Oscar. I'm just holding this in my hand right now and enjoying this. An actor or actress can be heralded as the greatest actor of a generation and only 19 votes could have sealed that deal. I couldn't believe it. I really didn't think I was going to win. I mean, I wish I had um, prepared something. I'd rather have 19 people voting that know what they're voting on rather than 19,000 that have no clue. Hollywood's best kept secret, number 86. I'm numb at the moment. <laughs> Coming up on 101 Best Kept Hollywood Secrets, nine years behind bars, the Shannon Doherty dilemma, and did Madonna pull a fast one? We'll be right back. Welcome back to 101 Best Kept Hollywood Secrets. At the 1991 Super Bowl, Whitney Houston delivered a stirring rendition of the Star Spangled Banner. Then the Giants beat the Bills. But after the game, the public clamored to hear Whitney's version of the anthem again. Whitney's label, Arista Records, released it as a single. The song hit the Billboard charts and stayed for seven weeks. But there was something the public didn't know. Whitney wasn't singing live that day. The diva was lip-syncing to a version of the song she recorded earlier in a studio. Maybe the record shouldn't have been labeled as performed at Super Bowl 25. Not exactly truthful, but at least all proceeds went to the Red Cross. Whitney lip-synced the national anthem. Okay, rewind that. Depending on her career, I can believe it. To be fair, a lot of performers sing along to their own recordings when playing outdoor venues to ensure a clean sound. Singing in a stadium is not the easiest thing, and when it's live and televised, you want it to be perfect. 
Oh say can you hear. Sometimes you can't be sure. Hollywood secret number 85. Whitney Houston lip syncing the anthem. Roseanne should have done that. Everyone knows that certain things are considered risky. Walking under a ladder, eating expired lunch meat, hiring Shannon Doherty. But in 1998, that's what Aaron Spelling did for the second time. Spelling cast Shannon in a show called Charmed. The raven-haired vixen played Alyssa Milano's sister. This is a show about three sisters who happen to be witches, not three witches who happen to be sisters. When Charmed premiered, the cast got along well. Doherty even served as a bridesmaid at Milano's wedding. But pretty soon, rumors surfaced that Shannon and Alyssa were fighting. Alyssa's got that personality where she sort of, you know, gets in there, nudges her way in, and just makes you like, go, okay, yeah, you're in. It seems Shannon and Alyssa clashed over everything from wardrobe to screen time. The two barely spoke except for their scenes together. The set was steeped in tension. You know, when you, when you work together for three years, you just sort of... You either hate each other or you slip into this really comfortable mode. There was tension, but there was, it was never three-dimensional in the way that we, we fought. By the end of season three, Alyssa allegedly gave the producers an ultimatum. Either she goes or I go. Alyssa won. Shannon went. <laughs> the producers held a press conference. They announced that Shannon was being released from her contract to pursue other opportunities. You can never cast chemistry you always you inherit chemistry did shannon jump or was she pushed we may never know the truth they weren't just witches they were weaches hollywood's best kept secret number 84 the behind the scenes turmoil on charmed if you were one of the millions of people watching the cosby show on march 2nd 1989 you witnessed a watershed moment in recording history. You also caught Best Kept Hollywood Secret number 83. For the very first time, a pop star released a new single via a TV commercial. The star, Madonna. The product, Pepsi. The single, Like a Prayer. The backlash, substantial. She is really someone whose career has been built on controversy. Pepsi executives apparently had no idea what was in the music video that was set to hit the airwaves the following day. The video featured controversial religious images, as well as a scantily clad Madonna dancing around burning crosses. She's always known that it's all about her. She's the story. Pepsi stood by Madonna at first, but a few days later, the $5 million TV commercial was pulled, never to be seen again. You never know if it was really a controversy that, you know, she had planned and kept secret. You never really know what's going on with her. Did Madonna deliberately keep the contents of her video a secret from Pepsi execs until the last moment? That remains best kept secret number 83. Coming up, from inmate to actor, the secret revealed. Stay tuned. Welcome back to 101 Best Kept Hollywood Secrets. You might remember actor Charles Dutton as the gruff but lovable patriarch on the TV series Rock. Here's my philosophy on garbage. I dump it in the truck, collect my paycheck, and stay away from knuckleheads like you. You may know him from his 50-plus movie roles over the last 20 years. You might even know him as the man who was once married to actress <laughs> Debbie Morgan, Dr. Angie Baxter of All My Children fame. But there's something about this talented actor that you probably don't know. I didn't do any more to him than what he would have done to me. Charles Dutton was born in a rough section of Baltimore. He definitely grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. In my neighborhood, seeing people being killed um, was an every week occurrence. In 1967, Charles was convicted of manslaughter for killing a man in a street fight. Dutton was 17 years old. He was sentenced to prison. Over a period of nine years, Charles Dutton had a chance to figure out his future. While serving time, Dutton completed a two-year college degree. He also developed a passion for theater. I read a play in prison. Through the reading of that play, I discovered what I was born to do with the rest of my time on this planet. 
After his release from prison, Dutton attended the Yale School of Drama. In his own words, he ended up going from jail to Yale. I'm just a guy who happened to take responsibility for his life and for himself and decided to turn it around after many hardships. There's an old saying, there's no mess you can't clean up, and if you serve your time and you pay society's price, you can move on, even perhaps with a very successful Hollywood career. A tragic secret. Redemption. Success. I think everybody deserves a second chance. Best kept secret number 82. Uh, I, I, I got it right here. <laughs> everybody knows celebrities get special treatment, but sometimes the requests of certain stars escalate from special to outrageous. According to the smoking gun, Christina Aguilera doesn't have to sit in traffic anymore. The young diva stipulates in her contract that she must have a police escort to the venue where she's performing in order to avoid nasty traffic jams. This gal wants to get to her fans on time. She's going to get there quickly and she's going to escape quickly. It's not that uncommon. There's a handful of people that really do want, you know, the quick in and out. There's no going too far on your request when you're a star. The smoking gun also obtained one of Eminem's contracts which stated that his hotel accommodations must include a widescreen TV, basketball hoop, and a bar stocked with Cristal champagne. Nothing too radical about that, but for one particular trip to London, the rapper requested a separate floor for his party of 30, featuring rooms with blacked out windows and private elevator. This request was so outlandish, it could not be accommodated. It's good to be a celebrity, isn't it? You can say, I only want a certain color M&M when I walk into a room. I only want certain flowers when I walk into a room, or else. And people will hop to it. Another document on the smoking gun revealed J.Lo's backstage needs. For a recent charity event where she made a 90-minute appearance, Jennifer Lopez's requirements included a white dressing room with a white couch, white tablecloths, white drapes, white flowers, and white candles. And that was for charity. She says, hey, I'm not a diva. I'm just, you know, Jenny from the Bronx. The smoking gun also shows that Britney Spears requires the carpet in her dressing room to be odorless. Some new carpets have a faint chemical smell, and the sensitive Spears reportedly feels this could affect her voice. I can't blame you because you want an odorless carpet, or, you know, if you're taking the, if you don't say no odor, you don't know what odor is actually going to end up in the carpet. We'll have more celebrity demands later in the countdown. Join us for part two of 101 Best Kept Hollywood Secrets as the countdown continues. Nicole Kidman, did she stand a ghost of a chance? The short films of Brad Pitt, the very short films. A screenwriter vanishes. His body turns up a year later. Why was no one talking? Plus, my mother always said, what's done in the dark will always come to light. Always. The entire town was stunned. That is the best kept secret in Hollywood. We'll see you very soon. It's such a good secret. I'm only one of the people that are privy to know that this is true. Show business. It just adds that juicy factor. <laughs> so you really have to keep your mouth shut. It's real. His hair is real. It was the best kept secret ever. You really can't believe everything you read. There are a lot of very famous people who, you know, had some fun time with each other before they became mega famous. I do think of him as being a rock 